Hello all, Old Geek here, and uh, we're looking at old magazines again. And this is White Dwarf, issue number 11 from February and March 1979. Still costing 60 pence. Not a good conversion right though, because um, $2 is a bit expensive. I think it was about $2 to the pound. So yeah, you're talking 60p is about the equivalent of $1.20 roughly so two dollars quite expensive 60p bit of a bargain maybe we shall find out right white dwarf number 11 the science fiction and fantasy games and miniatures a magazine D, &D barroom brawl traveler weapons fiend factory four winds right it's um it's an odd but interesting cover um Looks like a John Blanche. He had very much his own uh, his own style. Not sure it's a sort of cover that would make me buy it as a big. I'm I'm a fantasy and horror nerd. I'm not a big fan of sci-fi, modern day weapons, anything anything like that. So would this cover have made me buy it? We don't know. Well, certainly, this individual looks quite disturbing. <laughs> Especially that bird lurking up from a bear, chained. Hmm. Quite know where to put it. Right, okay. Games Centre. Largest selection of games in the world. Um, anybody? Can anybody? Um, confirm or otherwise this uh, the truthfulness of this advertisement they can make the claim over <sighs> the 3,000 different items the choice is yours 3,000 different lines or 3,000 different items because if you're selling <laughs> 3,000 paint brushes and they're all the same Just saying, just saying. Okay. Sci-fi fantasy oh sci-fi fantasy game shop, thousands of figures, etc. That's in Surrey. Citadel miniatures. Ah is this where Citadel Miniatures began, Games Workshop and Brian Ansel are proud to announce the formation of Citadel Miniatures Limited. Citadel were the miniatures that I bought when I uh, I was a teenager. That's what was sold. Um, didn't bother me whether it had Val Partha on it or Games Workshop, or whatever. Citadel Miniatures. It's got to be one of the longest running brand names consistently in the hobby. This is when they did stuff that was used for fantasy games, your D&D stuff. Look, you got uh, Elf Lord, Land Dragon with Mounted Lancer, Goblins of the South with Spears, Wolf Ride of the Night with Axe Mounted on Wolf. Yes, really good. They did some great miniatures, actually. Did some really good miniatures. Okay. What's this space for the release of Citadel's own ranges next issue? I shall do. Right, okay, uh, let's have a look at what's in this one. Featured on the centre spread of this issue is the layout for a barroom brawl scenario using D&D rules. Excellent. That's what we want to see. White Dwarf was known for its scenarios um, more than anything. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm interested in looking at that. Firearms 3000 AD, weapons editions for Traveller, not interested. Fiend Factory, news, letters, borrow and brawl, humanoid variations, new aliens. Valley of the, Valley of the Four Winds. I, I'm not particularly optimistic apart from this borrow and brawl thing for this issue. Oh, well. Cover illustration by John Blanche, yes. Yes. Right. Firearms 3000 AD by Brian Asprey. As I've said many, many times, and I'm a bit of a stuck record about it, 
I'm not a sci-fi fan, so skippity, skippity, skip, 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 skip. Oh, that's a stormtrooper. I recognise that. Um, skip, 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 skip. Fiend factory. Right. Let's see what we've got. Lauren. <laughs> Oh, we've got Pamela and Jane and Margaret. No, just Lauren. Spook with a stench. Is that any, any, um, there was a with a weed that appeared in the, in the Fiend Folio. Any relation? Or maybe any sort of connection? Maybe shall we, we'll find out. Tribe of the Stone by Jack McCardle. Humanoids. Prehensile Tales. Oh, they, they turn you into one of them. Yes. Go into, be specific. It says here, the main purpose is to seek, seek subjects to turn into more of their kind. They do this by carrying off a victim and subjecting him to the necessary alterations in their hidden lairs. Yeah. Give me some specifics. What do they do to them? Where are those lairs? What do they become? Is, is there any real description of what they are? No. No, there's no real description of what they are other than... Humanoids, slightly under human height, about five foot, and a prehensile tails. Get more description, please. Burbalang. They made it into the fiend folio. Sheet Phantom. They made it into the fiend folio. Right. We've still got Monster Mark. I've spotted it. There. The La... Lapidon? Lapidon? Awful. That that writing is awful. It's a lapidon because the scan hasn't come through particularly well. An animated rope. Yes. There's always a bit of silliness in here, isn't there? Devil dog. Yes, I've seen those before. News. There are to be some changes to the D&D box set. Included will be a basic module entitled In Search of the Unknown. Taking the place of the former Geomorphs and Monster Treasure List. Also be available separately. Yes. I'm very much in favour of putting a solid example teaching adventure in with beginner's box sets. I'm on record of saying that numerous times. Letters. Dear White Dwarf, I'm sure everybody remembers Don Turnbull's Monster Mark system published in White Dwarf 1 to 3. Since then, there's been no serious challenge to it in your magazine, and this placid acceptance worries me. Before we go any further, don't get me wrong, the system is outstanding in its ability to calculate a melee value for most monsters, and as long as a monster has no special abilities other than those in increasing its punch in close combat, the system is virtually flawless. Even so, it falls very short when taking into account other types of special abilities. It's far from flawless, because it's just formulae, nerdy mathematics, over the top, if you go back and look at the mathematics, it, you have to sit there with a calculator. You should never have to do that. No need. There's no need for it. No need for it at all. Don't want any more additions to the formula either. So whoever wrote this, James Honko, from Valparaiso in the USA. Perhaps, James, you would like to complete Don's system for the benefit of our readers. Please don't. I hope you didn't. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> the age-old battle, the age-old argument, crossbows versus longbows. I... I fall down on the side of the longbow. I'm British. It's lighter. 
more versatile. You can arc fire. It's much faster. You can quickly remove the strings. Battle of Cressy. The crossbows will be pretty useless because the strings got wet. The English army removed the strings, kept them dry. Also at the Battle of Cressy, the um, Genoese crossbowmen had left their pavises behind. They had no cover while they were cranking those bows to load them, which led to them being slaughtered. The longbowmen, much faster, much, much faster. The lack of cover doesn't matter so much when <laughs> you can fire an arrow every few seconds. So I'm in favour of the longbow. In terms of pure power, I accept that the crossbow may have had more puncturing ability, certainly at short range. The crossbows, if you've got a big long line of crossbowmen at relatively short range, all firing in big volleys, that it would be that's brutal. But it's direct direct fire. Arcing is not not really possible with a crossbow. So you have to have those crossbowmen at the front. Of course, it is easier to learn to fire a crossbow than it is. I mean, the training for longbows was long and extreme. And archers were expensive to train. So look, there's, two, there's pluses and minuses for all of them. Um, See, both have their pros and their cons. If you've got the time and the choice, you go for the longbow. That, that's it's as simple as that. And no, neither can puncture armor, not to any great degree, not plate armor. You might be able to break linkages in chain armor if you're lucky, but sheer volume of fire is what gets through uh, plate armor because by luck something might pierce that pierce that visor um getting the between the cracks um between the plates or most importantly hit the horses spook the horses throw the riders so no i've, I mean, I've seen a number of the tests on youtube and i'm not convinced a crossbow could puncture Good quality plate armour. Then of course there's the shattering. That's key. You know, notice on the breastplates, they curve there. It's not, not for style or anything. That's to protect the neck. Because arrows and bolts shatter and fly up. They were clever. They were clever. Right, anyway. <laughs> Me, I've weighed into that argument. Coffer Corpse. Don Turnbull questions whether the player should be affected by fear. Uh, if a corpse is rising up again, yeah, yeah, you can you can put whatever you like. Um, I recently conducted a survey of D&D &D and fantasy games people through Troll Crusher and News from Bree. I asked people to list the basic four character classes in order of preference. A few gave only first choice. The result is tabulated below. Magic user came out top. Thief came out bottom. Magic user, fighter, cleric, thief. And there we are. Barroom Brawl D&D &D style. Okay, so we have a scenario. Have a look. Is there a map? There we go. Map. Hex map. Who put an advert in the middle of this? There. So you've got you've got a map. It's, it's as as the name sounds. I am guessing this is. It's setting a scene for. A. Um, fight in a bar room feels a bit wargamey though in the way it's set out unless that's how it's meant to be i don't know i prefer things theater of the mind when it comes to old D, &D wherever possible yeah 
I've got these counters to lay out. Lots of enemy stats. Okay. I mean, yes. By all means, put in scenarios. Put in um, set-piece encounters. And lay out a, a bar room. And have a brawl. <laughs> That's what the game's all about. Fisticuffs. More adverts. Humanoid variations for starships and spacemen. No, thank you. Sorry. Open box. These are reviews. Dimension 6. It's going to be sci fi. Rune Quest. Chaosium. What do they say? What do they say? 9 out of 10. Cool. Good start. Middle Earth. Is it a war game or is it a, an RPG? Five out of ten. It's quite expensive at twelve quid as well. All in all, I'd say the game set in Middle Earth is only fair. Tolkien deserves much better. Okay, it looks like it's more of a board game, more of a board game or war game. So, yeah, armies and to command and stuff like that. Okay, open box dungeon modules reviews. Ten out of ten. Oh, I don't think I've seen a ten out of ten before. This is for D1, 2 and 3. Well, yeah, it is a bit of a classic series. Um, 10 out of 10. Quality. Little Old Man. Regular occupants of most dungeons. And so we thought readers would like to read some of the variations on the theme. These were originally submitted to the, to the Themes Factory. The Peacemaker. <laughs> it's basically a pacifist. The Weirdo. We shouldn't need any help in designing weirdos. We've got inspiration from ourselves. <laughs> okay. The friend. That's what we need help with. Sorry. <laughs> but you know it's true. We weren't very good at that, were we, when we were little? Okay. Um, magic items, ring of arms. Gives you arms, lots of things. The weak, oh, the weakling. A new class. All human humanoids are eligible for this class. Weaklings cannot carry anything, not even treasure, because they're far too weak. Oh, joy. Should any character wish to be a weakling, his strength, constitution, dexterity, and charisma must, charisma must all be seven or below. <laughs> uh. Spells pity. Ah. Victims of this spell will take pity on the cast and will not attack him or his party unless physically threatened. Please don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. All weaklings are afraid of the dark, so light spell. Cower in shadows. This is hide in shadows. Speed. Cast her to run at double speed when running away from pursuers. I was very good at that when I was a teenager. <laughs> Leg it. It saved it. I had a big map when I was in my teens. And what saved me from most of my beatings was the ability to run. Yeah. <laughs> Z. A nippy little bugger. <laughs> well, there weren't many who were going to catch me. <laughs> All right. Weakens gain experience for not running away from foes and for casting spells. Ah. Hit dice of foe, chance of running away, experience gained through staying. <laughs> These titles. Amateur weakling, six stone weakling, five stone weakling, four stone weakling. Coward sissy, milk sop, chicken, runaway weed, super weed. It tells you what speed you can, uh, what spells you can use. Yeah, of course, it is a joke class, in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> Very amusing, though. Valley of the Four Winds, that's a bit of fiction. I've not read any of that. Dodgy bit of artwork. More ads. More ads. More ads. Welcome to Gamma World, ladies. We've been expecting you. 
Right, let's have a think about that issue. I think I like the cover, even if it's not my genre. I think I do like it. It's different. It's quite. It's, it's a decent piece of art. Um, there wasn't a lot in there for me, was there? There was a weakling, which was funny. You wouldn't use it. Some decent entries in the Fiend Factory. A few reviews. Um, some new bits and bobs. And of course, there's a D and D scenario. Uh, but just like it's a it's a single encounter set piece type scenario rather than a, a proper adventure. I get these magazines need to cover all areas of the hobby, but uh, there's sci-fi fiction. White Dwarf is going through a bit of a a slump. Certainly, the last few editions I've looked at. It came into the hot into the market first few um, editions first first few issues were brilliant especially the first one but it settled into a 28 page uh, magazine of which about half are adverts and then it tries to separate out those other 14 pages across all genres and if you're not into all genres you're not getting a lot for your money. Okay, my own fault. Not being into all genres. I think that's quite a weak addition. Ho hum. That's the way it goes. I've been the old geek. I hope you've enjoyed this read through. Don't shout at me too much. I don't care to be honest. Shout at me all you like. See ya.